The subject matter for this morning is compassion, mercy, and forgiveness. Now, there's a lot of, of hard preaching that needs to be done, and I would say probably even the majority of the preaching needs to be hard preaching against sin and against wickedness and, and having high standards and, you know, how we ought to be living our life. But we need to have a proper balance in our life of love, mercy, forgiveness, long-suffering, all these great attributes that God possesses and that He wants us to have also. And we could never lose sight of this because when we start losing sight of, of keeping the proper balance, people have a tendency to, to get this holier-than-thou type of an attitude. They tend to get more lifted up in pride. I'm going to preach about pride later tonight. So the two kind of go hand in hand, but we're starting off going into these aspects and what we see in Micah chapter 7 there's obviously a lot of doom and gloom in the first uh, the, the almost the whole chapter the whole first portion there's a, there's a lot of judgment coming but what we see at the very end of the passage in verse number 18 the Bible says who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage he retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy the bible is saying we have a god that yes he does get angry yes god's going to bring judgment yes god is a god that will do these things we need to be aware of that and we need to live our lives in a way such that we're, we're respecting god and understanding that there is judgment there is punishment you do reap what you sow but but thank god that god doesn't retain his anger forever that we get ang and this is in the context especially of of his people you know the remnant of his heritage because people who aren't saved, people who aren't born again, people who aren't children of God, that anger does continue forever in the pits of hell. That is something that lasts forever. But for his people, people who are born again, people who are saved, people who have already put their trust in Jesus Christ, you know, God still gets angry with you. God gets angry with us. Just as much as sometimes I get angry with my own children. But thank God his anger doesn't last forever and he actually delights in showing mercy. God wants to show mercy on people. God wants us to have his mercy come upon us. It says in verse number 19, he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. God's a good God. We need to remember this attribute, this aspect of God, that he has this compassion upon us so that when we live our lives, we don't have to be, you know, we, we ought to have high standards. We ought to, to not bend when it comes to compromising on what's right and wrong, on what the Bible says, on these various things. But at the same time, we need to be able to exhibit compassion upon other people and not always take the hardest line possible and just have no tolerance for people to even just making mistakes. We're not, we're not saying that the sin is justified. We're not saying that it's okay to get off into sin. But we're going to try to, to gain a godlike type of an attitude and response to sin. Does God get angry when we sin? Yes, he does. But does God keep his anger forever? No. Is God quick to forgive and to pardon? Yes, he is. God's quick to show his mercy. God's quick to be compassionate upon us. But with God, it all comes down to our hearts. Right? God's not looking to, to keep anger against his people and to just continue to, to bring judgment and destruction and doom and gloom. That's not what he wants. He will continue to do what's necessary for us in judgment for the purpose of getting us back, getting our heart right with him. And, and God will be very quick to then receive us back in with him. Uh, Psalm, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 4, Psalm 145, verse number 8, the Bible says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Again, just, and, and you can see that all through. You read the Psalms, you see these attributes of God, this long-suffering, full of compassion. God isn't on a hair trigger to get angry about things. You know what? We ought not to be either. 
We ought to be angry about sin. We ought to be angry about things that, you know, in the world's going on. But we don't need to just be like, just, just every little thing that's going to get you angry. And, you know, we could also take some parenting advice from this as well. When we take into consideration that we are God's people, we're children of God. God is, think about how slow to anger God has been with you personally. I mean, think about all the mistakes you've made in your life. And even maybe just the past week or the past month or whatever, just, just things where you failed, areas where you know, hey, I could be doing better. Hey, I should be doing more. Oh, I did this and, and that's, I, that, I know that's not right and I shouldn't be doing that. Everybody makes mistakes like that. Nobody's perfect. But what you're going to find is especially if your heart is right and you fail and you stumble, but you keep getting up, moving forward, you know, you have a humble heart, you're not going to find much, you know, hair trigger of God being angry and just coming down on you for every little thing that you do. You're not going to see that. People don't see that in their life. Now, if you're, I don't care what God says, I don't care what the Bible says, then you better expect to have that judgment coming down. But God is full of compassion. He's gracious. I mean, he was gracious enough to give us salvation and give us eternal life when we didn't deserve it to begin with. That is just overbounding with his, with his graciousness and his compassion for sinners. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to get a little bit more in depth in this passage into how our mindset ought to be and how we ought to balance ourselves out. Look at verse number 17 in Ephesians chapter number 4. The Bible says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. So this is talking about other Gentiles, you know what, they walk in the vanity of their own mind. Obviously he's saying Gentiles, he's writing to the Ephesians. They're Gentiles, but they're saved. They're believers. They're believers that are Gentiles. He's saying don't walk like the other Gentiles walk, like the, other, like the heathen do. He's saying their understanding is darkened. They're going through this life. They're past feeling. And, and you know, one of the things you need to have with compassion is feeling. Right? You're being compassionate towards others. You care about other people. It says their past feeling, they've already given themselves over unto lasciviousness and wickedness to do this, to, you know, to work all uncleanness and just greediness, and, and that's where they're going. He's saying, but that's not where you should be. You have not so learned Christ. Verse 21, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. They put off concerning the former, excuse me, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I wanted to go through that whole passage. We're going to jump back now and, and, and read through some of these passages that we just read. The Bible's explaining here that we need to put on the new man. It's created in righteousness, it's created in holiness. Now, we're preaching about having compassion on people and being forgiving, having mercy. Well, the, to start with, when you are getting sin out of your life and, and by not transgressing against other people, you're actually showing compassion towards them. A lot of people in the world might think it's not that big of a deal to, to, to lie or to cheat or to do whatever you need to do to get your job done. 
right? Out in the world, you might come across that mentality. People being dishonest in order for them to get gain. That's a very common mindset among many people out in the world today. But the Bible is teaching us, hey, that's not how you've learned Christ. That's not how you're supposed to walk. And the reason why I'm bringing this up, you're not very compassionate when you don't care about what someone else, how someone else is impacted. Anytime you're lying to somebody or about someone, you're negatively impacting that person. The Bible says that you hate that person when you're lying to them or even about them. That's not showing compassion. We need to walk with holiness. So that's why it says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbors, with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Verse 26 now says, Be ye angry and sin not. So this is saying, you know, there is a time to be angry. Just like God's angry with sin, with wickedness. We can be angry too. But the Bible is saying, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So what that's saying is sometimes it's okay to have righteous anger about things. When things get you upset and you get angry, it's for a good cause, for good reason. There's nothing wrong with that. God gave us an emotion of anger that is not in and of itself a sin to just be angry about something. You know, I get angry when I hear about kids being defiled by adults or by anybody. That makes me angry. That's a righteous anger. There's nothing wrong with being angry about things like that. There's other things that people might get angry about. And you know what? Maybe they're not justified. But I'm not going to preach all about anger this morning because the, the part that we're focusing on here is just be angry and sin not. So where does the sin come in when you harbor that anger and you just hold on to it and you keep it from day to day to day and you become an angry person? See, the Bible doesn't want you to be an angry person. We can be angry sometimes. Jesus was angry sometimes. He was angry when he walked in the temple and he saw people buying and selling in the house of prayer and he, and he made a whip and he, made, and he drove him out of the temple. That made him angry. But you know what Jesus didn't do? He didn't just keep going, oh man, I'm just, so, I'm just so angry. I can't believe they did that. You know, and that just festered. It didn't just fester in him for, you know, day, you know, up to the next day and the next day and the next day. You let it go. It's dealt with. It's done. It's over. When things like that happen, we need to get past that. So the sin here about being angry and sinning not says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath so you're real angry what that means is don't let the day end so you don't let the sun go down don't let the day end where you're still angry you're still wrathful is still bothering you're still upset about that and just and just angry and he says and it says neither give place to the devil why because the devil wants you to, to just get wrapped up in being angry about things i mean because you know what that's going to do it's going to distract you from doing what you need to do anyways or it's going to get you on the wrong path what are some reasons why people get angry? Well, probably one of the number one reasons is if someone does you wrong. Someone does wrong to you. It's going to make you angry. Well, it's okay to get angry about that, but if you continue to hold on to that anger and just hold it up inside of you, what's going to end up happening is you're probably going to end up trying to figure out some way to get back at that guy. When the more it just eats at you, you're going to be, oh man, that guy did me wrong. I need to do something about this. But the Bible says vengeance belongs unto the Lord. And this is one of the reasons why we could let go of that anger. Because God sees everything that happens. And it's not incumbent upon us to just right every wrong. And when someone does wrong unto you, the Bible says, hey, most of the time you just take it. You just, you just go with it. I mean, if someone does you wrong, God sees that, he'll deal with it. And we don't need to hold on to that type of an anger. And uh, we see that God doesn't hold on to anger against us and especially when we're dealing with brethren, we don't need to hold that anger on uh, with anyone else. But uh, let's keep going here. Verse number 28, the Bible says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. There's so many little things, that we could preach probably entire sermons on many of these verses that are coming up, but here, just, just speaking in the spirit of having compassion on others, of course you're not going to steal from someone if you have compassion on them. You're not going to take what belongs unto them. But then it also goes on here to say, don't let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. The things that you say to people, they should be good for the use of edifying. We're concerned. It's, it's, it's keeping this spirit of, of thinking about other people. 
and being mindful about them so that you're thinking about edifying that person, building them up and ministering grace unto the hearers that our communication shouldn't be corrupt. Now, corrupt communication doesn't mean someone's getting a rebuke because that's not corrupt. Because rebuke isn't pleasant. And sometimes people need to be, need to hear rebukes when they're wrong about things. And that's kind of, all, that's a whole number of sermon. And see, we, we get, if we get too involved in just talking about and thinking about and preaching about rebuking and, and everything else, we're going to lose sight of the compassion. We're going to lose sight of the area that, hey, we still need to keep this, this balance so that we don't just become all rebuke all the time, all just super hard Christian, just, you know, that, that's not who we're supposed to be. There's, there's a, a tenderness and a mercy that God has that we need to have that really ought to drive who we are and, and how we interact with people more than the, the hardness. Verse number 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, being bitter towards people and being bitter about things. You know, when someone does you wrong or something bad happens, you ought to be able to let it go. The bitterness creates resentment. You start resenting people. And especially in marriages, you know, when you're married to someone, you have to learn if your husband or your wife does you wrong, you have to learn to be able to let that go. When you harbor bitterness in your heart against someone, especially your spouse, that's gonna, it's just going to harm, it's going to do more damage to your marriage than even the act originally did. Whatever, whatever the transgression was, whoever it happened to be that was in the wrong, whatever they did, you know, even if it was something major, the more you hold on and just retain that and be bitter and, and angry, your, ne your, ne your marriage is never going to heal and it's only going to produce more and more problems. You're going to keep going back to that. The Bible says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as, Christ, as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And that last verse there, verse number 32, will help us to have the right attitude in how we ought to be dealing with everybody. When you remember that God has forgiven you, God's forgiven your transgressions, your iniquities, for Christ's sake, because of what Christ did for you when he died on the cross, God has extended mercy, has extended forgiveness unto you. Don't forgive that. Don't forget that when, you, when other people transgress you. We've transgressed God countless times. Yet he has given us forgiveness. We need to remember that when people do us wrong, we need to have a tender heart, not a hard heart, a soft heart. A heart of compassion that says, okay, you've done me wrong, but I'm going to forgive you. We need to make sure we're not too hard on people, you know, because especially you have your own faults. Everybody's done wrong. And you want to make sure you don't fall into this hypocrisy of thinking that you're so great and everybody's done you wrong and, and you're so much better than them. Um, watch out for that. Turn to, turn to Hebrews chapter 5. I'm going to read for, as you're going to Hebrews 5, I'm going to read from Mark chapter 6, verse 34. The Bible says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. So when Jesus saw the mul just multitudes of people, he's out in public, and these people are coming to him, he has compassion on them. He feels for them. He feels bad for them because he looks on them, and he's like, they're just like sheep not having a shepherd. They have no direction. They have nobody watching over them. They have nobody helping them. They're, they're just out there just wandering about. These people need help. So he has compassion on them. He's like, you know what? I'm going to come over and I'm going to help these people. And he preaches to the multitudes. And he does his best to help them, to give them what they need. But this is how he, you know, he doesn't look at people with disgust. 
He doesn't look at them and say, oh man, I'm not going to have anything to do with those people. He sees a group of people. They're like sheep without a shepherd. He says, I'm going to have compassion on them. I'm going to go and try to help them. Hebrews chapter 5, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. We need to have compassion on the ignorant. There's a lot of people who just don't know. That's what ignorance is. Ignorance is when you don't know. It doesn't mean you're stupid. There's a difference between being ignorant and being stupid. Being stupid is people who just can't learn or don't want to learn. They have a problem with, with, with learning and understanding. Ignorant people are people who haven't heard and don't know. So no matter how old you are, you can be 40 years old and be unsaved because you've never heard the gospel, because you don't even know what it is. You can be ignorant and be an adult and be a successful adult, but just be ignorant of the truth. And then when you hear the truth, that's going to determine you know, if you're stupid or not, if, you wanna, if you're going to receive it or not, because you are stupid if you reject the gospel. But it's such an easy thing to believe and to accept and uh, it's kind of a no-brainer, really ought to be. But you're ignorant if you, if you just don't know something. Now, we ought to have compassion on the ignorant. Now, ignorant because they're unsaved or ignorant even when they are saved. We need to have compassion on people, especially the new believers. You know, when people just start getting into church, you know, it's... <laughs> It's not our place to just go around with this attitude of, of having like, oh man, you do this and this and this. I can't believe you do that. You know, and just, and just harassing people when they just, maybe they just got saved a week ago or something. Or like, you know, we had a visitor last week. They just got saved that morning. You know, I'm not going to go up to that guy and be like, you know, start pointing out. I'm not going to, I'm not even going to, you know, point out whatever that I could point out just, just by looking at somebody, right? We have compassion on that person. Hey, he just got saved. He's ignorant to, a, to what the Bible says. He's ignorant on, like, everything. So we're not going to go and, and start trying to just rebuke him on everything because that's not what he needs at that time when, he, when you're a babe. And, you, know, you, don't, you, don't, you don't rebuke a baby, you know, a newborn, and in, uh, suckling, like they're not going to know what you're, what you're saying and what you're doing. They need compassion. They need help. We need to be able to identify and, and have this compassion in ourselves that we can be compassionate on the ignorant to help them to, see, to understand and see the truth and um, understand that, you know, we also have our own infirmities. We have our own weaknesses. No matter how strong you think you are, you have weaknesses too. You understand that about other people and be able to show compassion towards people when they do have their weaknesses. You know, last week I went into, you know, who we should break fellowship with and what things, you know, what are the criteria? What do, what do we look at? And 1 Corinthians 5 had a big list and those things that, yeah, they're very serious sins. And for people who are not ignorant, right, people who already know this stuff, people who we referred to as a brother or a sister in Christ, someone that should know better, and they're getting involved with this, yes, it's appropriate for their benefit to love them enough to shun them and to not have anything to do with them and not to eat with them and to put that wicked person away from among you. But now I want to go back to dealing with people who are unsaved or maybe family members or other people that just, you know what? They're in the world. And shunning people like that. The, this is not what 1 Corinthians 5 was about. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 9, I'll read this. We read this last week. I'll read it again. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So he said, I already told you you shouldn't just be hanging out with fornicators. But he wants to clarify himself. He says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters. For then must you needs go out of the world. He said, I'm not talking about just unsaved people in the world that you just can't have anything to do with them, you can't have a meal with them, you can't do anything at all. He's saying because then you just wouldn't be able to talk to anybody and you just have to kind of go out of the world. 
It's not that he wants us to start a commune and build a building and have this big fence around us and be like, we're going to be separate from the whole world and we're not going to have anything. To, they're all wicked sinners and we're going to be righteous in here and we're only going to deal with righteous people and, you know, forget everyone else out there. No, that's not, that's, that some people get that kind of mindset because they're completely backwards on the whole point and purpose of the Bible and us being here. <laughs> the point is to go out and reach people with the truth, not to just distance ourselves from everybody and everything. Now, there's a difference between being best friends with somebody and, and spending all of your time with someone. You know, I don't think we ought to be doing that with people who are unsaved. That can be a bad influence just because you're, you're getting real close and spending a lot of time your personal time with them and seeing what they do and letting that rub off on you. But at the same time, it's, you're not going to treat them as someone who's a brother in Christ that you know is a foreigner and be like, you know what, I'm not going to go eat to lunch with you. They're two different things. The people who are unsaved, just out in the world, go ahead and have a meal with those people. Go ahead and have that type of a, you know, acquaintance, relationship, or whatever, or especially if it's family members, do family functions. Hang out with them. It's fine. You ought to love your family. And we ought to be a good example and have compassion on the ignorant and have compassion on people that are out in the world. They're not the, you know, these brothers that know better and everything else. They're just people out in the world. We need to have compassion on people like that. We need to balance the hard preaching, the hard attitude against sin when dealing with people in the sinful world. Yes, in church, we're going to thunder against it. Yes, we're going to call out wickedness for what it is. Yeah, we're going to call out the deeds of this world, that they're evil and that they're wicked. And we're not going to back down on that. We're not going to apologize if someone out in the world find, you know, understands or hears us or, or knows that we believe a certain way. We're not going to say, oh, no, sorry, I don't. We're not going to make excuse. Not at all. We're going to continue to proclaim the truth. But the way that you deal with somebody who's ignorant, who's unsaved, is different than the way you deal with someone who already ought to know better. The standard that you use with people out in the world is not the same as the standard that we retain in church. Out in the world, do you have... You, I mean... I do, and anyone here who has a job that has to deal with other people, you know, I mean, you, you live in the world. And there's things you have to do just to, just to live and survive, and there's nothing wrong with that either. Not according to Scripture. I'm sure there's fornicators at my job. Now, I don't know that much about everybody individually, but I, I bet you they're there. I bet there's all kinds of different people there. But I'm not going to not go out and have lunch with somebody just because they're in the world, they're unsaved, and they're doing these things. I'm, I'm, what, what I ought to be doing is having compassion and telling them the truth and, and speaking the truth in love and that hopefully they could come out of the snare of the devil and that they can, um, you know, those that oppose themselves can, can find repentance. And that's, that's what we ought to be doing. We need to be careful. Turn to Luke chapter 7. We need to be careful not to get the same attitude that the Pharisees had because the Pharisees are a great example of people who didn't have compassion. They were one big hypocrite because they would say, oh, you know, they'd make up all these laws and things that you couldn't do, but it was okay for them to do, that they were guilty of all this stuff. And then they were flipping the word of God upside down on its head and not following, you know, not teaching the things that they ought to have been teaching. But then they would go real hardcore, like on the tithing. Yeah, they went really down into the nitty gritty of tithing. They made sure that everybody knew you need to pay. I mean, I don't care what you got coming in your house, that smallest little bit. You get seasoning from somebody, from your neighbor, you better be paying a tithe of that. They were real strong on that, Right? But they, they overlooked the weightier matters of, of love and of the law and, and judgment and mercy and compassion. Luke chapter 7. Uh, everything about the fair, they completely missed the whole point of, like, of the Bible, of God's word. 
They always wanted to bring other people down. They loved being lifted up in their pride and everyone looking to them. But then what did they do? They're the ones, you know, Jesus is out doing a good work. He's out soul winning. He's got his disciples. And what are they doing? Oh, what are, what are they doing picking off those ears of corn off there and eating that? What, what do they think they're doing? You know, can you let the guy do a good work for the Lord? I mean, he's healing people. He's out, you know. Now, obviously, we know Jesus wasn't wrong. But even if he was, but he's out doing this great work. Let's just say it wasn't Jesus, but someone else, some other prophet at the time. And they're just going to go, oh, wh what do you guys think you're doing? You're eating that corn on the Sabbath day? You know, like, let them be. You know, let them do their, let them do the work. Praise God. You don't have to bring everybody down when they're doing a good thing. You know, throw a wet blanket over it. But we're going to see this attitude that they had, not just towards, you know, they had it towards everybody, but especially towards people they deemed to be sinners, right? The, the, the low, the low class people. Luke chapter 7, verse number 37, the Bible says, And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. You see that attitude? Now, this woman, she's doing nothing wrong. In fact, she's being extremely humble and showing more respect than any, you know, respect and love unto Jesus than a person possibly could. I mean, she's, she's on her knees just crying. She brought probably whatever is the most precious thing, she, you know, this ointment that she had to wash Jesus' feet with. And she's using her hair and, you know, and, and on her face and doing this. And the guy, all the guy is going to think about is, oh, that's so wicked. You don't, you don't even want her touching you. You shouldn't have her touching you. If he were really a prophet, if he really knew, if he was any type of prophet, he would know and would have, no he would, he would push that woman away and have nothing to do with her. And, oh, don't, don't you touch me. Don't you know that you're a sinner? That's the attitude that the Pharisees had. And that's the attitude we need to make sure we don't have. And one really good way to help keep you humble is to not just study and read your Bible all the time and never go out sowing. That's the worst thing you can do. You need to go out and, ha and show compassion on people and go to people of low estate and condescend to, low to people of low estate and, and go out and bring the gospel to them and not have this, this better than you type of an attitude, but actually care about them and try to help them. Jesus explains to this Pharisee, but even, see, Jesus has compassion not just on this lady, but even also to the Pharisee. He tells the Pharisee that he's wrong. Basically, you know, he, he teaches him and instructs him. But Jesus had compassion on both. Look at verse number 44. Jump down to verse 44 in this chapter. The Bible says, And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And Jesus says, you know, he says, like, I know she's a sinner. I know she sinned a lot. I know who this is. But you know what? Her sins are forgiven. She's humble. I'm not going to cast her out. Jesus wants people. He wants sinners coming to him. The Pharisees don't want the sinners coming to them. No, no, no. You need to get your sin out and then you can come to us. That sounds just like the repent of your sins, people. No, 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 no. You, you have to give up all of your sin and then you can come and join our group. Go get rid of all your sins first. Jesus is like, no, come to me first. <laughs> come to me and I'll forgive you. Jesus went and ate with the Pharisee. Don't forget that either. Because, you know, 
I think people get a little bit overboard with not having enough compassion and just, and just I don't want to call it common sense, but I understand having a, wanting to be right down the line with God's word. And I think that's a great, we all ought to, to care about that Very, and, and, and treat that with, with the utmost respect and, and, why, and look at God's word and want to follow God's word to a T. We ought to. That's a good thing to have. But sometimes we get a little bit clouded in, in digging in so deep and being too worried about doing everything wrong that you kind of forget the whole point. Right? And that's what I'm talking about with like, you know, when people start shunning everybody out of their life. You've gone too far. Okay, you're taking things to, you know, too much to the extreme on that front. We need to remember what it's all about and have compassion on people. We need to remember when we have unsaved relatives. I've got unsaved family members, plenty of them, but I don't shun seeing them. The only, the only unsaved family member I would, I would shun, which I don't, we don't even have one that I'm aware of or confident of at the moment, but if we had someone who was just a sodomite and a hater of God, okay, I would shun that person. I have no problem with that. But that's because they're a reprobate. Everybody else, I'm not going to shun. Now, you have to be able to stand on conviction. So let's, let's add a little bit of just, uh, you know, application. I've heard from many people, and I've had this dilemma myself, and I've thought about it quite a bit, but when dealing with unsaved people or family or whatever, you say, well, what do you do? What should I do? You know, if, if uh, you know, I've had people ask a question, well, my dad drinks alcohol or whatever. We're invited to these parties. We're invited to a Christmas gathering or something like that. And here's what I do, because I don't want to just forsake my whole family, but at the same time, you know, I care about my immediate family and my children and I don't want my kids being around a bunch of people who are getting drunk and everything like that so what we do is we'll go over there early and we always try to go somewhere early so if we know there's going to be people you know busting out with alcohol and things like that and things that we don't agree with and we don't really want to be around we just go early and we'll let people you know people all know already where we stand on things so we kind of leave it up to them and be like hey we we love you we want to spend time with you. You know, and these are unsaved people, okay? They know what our religion is. They know, we love you. We care about you. We want to spend time with you. This is where we stand on this. And we're going to do everything we can to try to be able to, to, to spend time together because they're ignorant. They're unsaved. We're going to, we're going to do our best to work around that but when push comes to shove, when it comes to conviction, I mean, we're, we're still not going to back down on, hey, we're not going to be hanging out with a bunch of people who are drunk. There's foolishness. Nothing good's going to come of it. So we don't do it. That's why, you know, I don't recommend for people, you know, if you're, all your friends are going out to the bar, your people just got saved. I know for a long time when I quit drinking, I would still go out to the bar, but just not drink. That was foolish. That was stupid. You shouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't have been doing that. But I was, I mean, I was also just hanging out with, with the wrong crowd in general. But when it comes to people like that, you know, you have to have your own limits. But be compassionate. Don't have this whole, you know, we try not to have this, oh, well, we're so much better than you because we don't drink. We don't put it out there like that. It's like, this is what we do. This is what we believe. And this is, this is going to prevent us from seeing you. But, you know, we want to see you or you guys can come over here or whatever. And, uh, and deal with things on that front. But, but we need to be careful not to get into this attitude of just, just shutting everybody out for their faults because they're wrong on this or on that. We need to have more compassion than that. Uh, and don't forget, Jesus went and ate with the Pharisee. The Pharisee wasn't right. Pharisee was a Pharisee. But Jesus still went and ate with him. The Bible says in, in that same chapter, in Luke chapter 7, verse 36, and one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. So he, he was invited to come eat. He says, okay, I'll come eat with you. He also ate with a publican. And, you know, a publican is one of those sinners. You know, one of the tax collectors. Uh, in Luke chapter 5, you want to flip back to that, just uh, 
Flip back to Luke chapter 5, verse number 27. Now, it also should be noted that these people were seeking Jesus to eat with them. I mean, they wanted him to, to be there. But he didn't refuse the Pharisee to come and eat with him, and he didn't refuse the publican either. Look at verse number 27. The Bible says, And after these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And Levi made, a great, made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. So Levi makes this great feast and he invites Jesus to come and eat at this, at this party he's having, this feast. And Levi was a publican. That's why he was sitting at the receipt of custom. He was taking taxes. He was receiving custom, customs, duties, taxes. Right? He's receiving all that stuff from people. But when Jesus said to follow him, he dropped all. He's like, okay, I'll follow you. Right? And then after that, he makes this great dinner and he invites a bunch of people and there's other publicans there, other people, co co-workers of his, other tax collectors. And then other sinners are there. Verse 30, it says, but their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with publicans? And say, oh, look at these guys. They're over here hanging out with these, with these publicans and these sinners. What are you doing eating with these people? Verse 31, And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's saying these, these people need our compassion. They need the help. So we are going to go to them. We will eat with them. And we will try to minister unto them and preach unto them. That's what it's all about. And we need to make sure that no matter how righteous you think you are and how much sin you get out of your life, that you can't pollute yourself by going and sitting down and having a meal with some sinner. That's the Pharisaical attitude. That's what the Pharisees thought. That's not what you ought to thought. Matthew chapter 5. Turn to, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5 verse number 44. The Bible reads, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So he's saying here, you need to have the attitude that God has. He says, go ahead, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, you know, do good unto them. Why? Because God makes the sun to rise. You know, the sun gives us sustenance. He makes the rain to come down. And, he, and he, gives, he gives blessings to people who don't deserve it. People that might even curse him. He still has the sun come up and the rain still you know, pours out. And they still are able to eat and survive and to keep going day to day. And he's saying, you need to have that same attitude. Love your enemies. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Verse number 46, For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. If all, you, if all the people you love is just your brothers and sisters in Christ who are right with God and that's it, well, of course, they're going to be loving you, you're going to be loving them. But the Bible's saying, okay, well, everybody does that. You just love someone that, that's going to love you back or that's right with God. You need to love people who aren't going to love you back. You need to have that attitude of compassion towards those that they're not going to do anything to you. They're not going to recompense you. They're not going to do anything more for you, but you love them anyways. The Bible says in verse 47, and if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publican so. If that's all you care about. Jesus is saying, no, you need to have compassion on other people. Now, um, Turn to Matthew chapter 18. You're in Matthew 5. Just flip over to chapter 18. And I brought this up last week, but when, you know, when people do wrong or make bad choices or do something that, even, that, that would force you to break fellowship with them, when they come back, when they return 
we ought to have compassion on them also and receive them back openly and willingly. We have the story of the, the prodigal son, right? That the, the symbolism there is you've got the son, who, or the, the, excuse me, the, the, the master of the house represents God, and he has two children, two sons, right? They're both sons, they're children of his. So the representation would be people who are born again, children of God. One's working for him and doing what he's supposed to be doing and continuing to work, and he's going to have a great reward. He's going to have a great inheritance. The other one chose to, no, give me what I have coming to me now, and he went off and he, and he made a lot of bad choices and just kind of had no regard for his father's house and his rules and his laws and everything, but he went off and did his own thing. Okay, but he's still a son. He was still a child. And when he comes back, when he realizes he had made mistakes and he had done wrong and he wants to come back and get things right with his father, his father has lots of compassion. I'll just read this verse for you. It says, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Just at that sight of seeing his son just you know, out in the distance coming back, his father had compassion and he was glad and happy and just, just really thankful to come and see him come back. And we ought to have that same type of an attitude. If someone does you wrong or someone does enough wrong that they're going to be you know, shunned or whatever, but they come back, we all ought to be ecstatic and very happy that that person comes back and, and show compassion towards them and not going, oh, what'd you do that for? Or, you know, try to hold it over their head and, and just, and, you know, bury them in shame if they're already coming back. Look, if they, they've already experienced the shame if they've gotten to the point of turning and coming back. You don't need to make them feel any worse about what they've done. Just encourage them and try to keep them back in here, when, you know, knowing that they're right with God. Matthew, we're almost done. Matthew chapter 18, we need to have compassion to forgive others. Verse number 26, the Bible says, The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patient with me, patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me, shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. Now, obviously there's a lesson to be learned there, and I think sometimes we might forget where we came from. We saw that last week. You know, God didn't want the children of Israel forgetting. You came out of a house of bondage. You were slaves. You were servants. You, I brought you out of that when I brought you into this land. You know, when I give you this promised land, I give you this inheritance and I'm blessing you. Don't forget where you came from. And I think many people, when they start getting right with God, and maybe they've been in church for a long time and they start really seeing leaps and bounds on, on getting sins out of their life and they're, getting, they're used to not having that sin in their life, then having this bad attitude towards people who are in the same place where they were maybe a decade earlier. Show the compassion because God had compassion on you if you had those problems. I know God's had a lot of compassion on me. And I'm very thankful for that. And I pray I, my heart never gets so cold where I get to the point where I can look down on people that are wrapped up in drinking or drugs or fornication or whatever and just... look down on them and push them out. No. Now, if they're a brother in Christ, obviously if they're a drunkard or a fornicator, you know, we're not, we're not going to keep fellowship. But someone like I was, a babe in Christ. And someone like that, we need to, we need to try to help those people out. And, and try to heal the sick, if as it were. And when people do wrong to us, forgive them. You know, God's forgiven you so much 
Uh, don't, don't be negligent of that either. And that's what that passage is really teaching anyways, is that forgiveness. Someone owes you something, someone does you wrong, you better be quick to forgive them as quick as God was to forgive you. Now, um, the last point I want to make, and maybe this is a little bit out of order, but we need to make sure we're not keeping any grudges against people. The Bible says even Leviticus 19, turn to um, Romans 12. It's the last place I'll be turned, Romans 12. Leviticus 19, 18 says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. We need to try to live peaceably as much as we possibly can with people. And in order to live peaceably, we can't have grudges and bitterness just swelling inside of us. Romans 12, look at verse number 17. The Bible says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So again, the Bible is saying that the whole goal, what we re we're not trying, the goal and the intent is not to just divide and separate with everybody and everyone in the whole world and just be at a hair trigger to just be like, oh, not have anything to do with you, not have anything to do with you, not have anything to do with you. No, we're trying to live peaceably with all men as much as we possibly can. That's what, we, that's what the desire is. That's what the goal is. Don't lose focus of the goal. Now, sometimes it may be necessary to have to cut people off, but that's not the intent or the goal. We're definitely not looking for every reason to be cutting people off and not having anything to do with them. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. And this is, he's going to explain how we can be, live peaceably as much as is possible with all men. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the spirit. That's the attitude. That's what we need to have. If you have that type of an attitude, it's going to be a lot easier to have compassion on people when you're trying to overcome their evil with good. When you're not letting them bring you down if they do you wrong, say, okay, you do something good for them. Someone does something bad to you and you do something good to them, that changes the whole dynamic real fast. I mean, imagine, to put it in, in a worldly perspective, you think about all the gangs out there that have never-ending violence. Why? Because all it takes is one person to do wrong to them, and then they're so full of pride. Oh, no, you can't do that to me. You can't do that. Go, I'm going to go back and we're going to get you. And then they go, oh, no, you can't do that to me. We're going to go back and get you. And you have these wars and these fights just going on forever, just continually, because no one can just say, oh, you did bad to me. I'm going to do good to you. I'm going to overcome evil with good. But if you have that attitude, the wars would stop. You know, the fightings, the strives, it would stop. Let's not forget the compassion, the mercy, the long-suffering that God had towards us, that Jesus has towards us. And, and you know, yes, where it's appropriate, we need to be able to... to not fellowship with certain people, but let's not lose sight of the whole point and the whole objective of us being here. And that's to, to reach people and, and to heal the sick and, and you know, people who need a physician. Let's point them to the physician. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words. I pray that you please help us all to have a, a proper spirit, dear Lord. And uh, we thank you for the, the mercy that you extend unto us regularly dear lord and that and that you are full of mercy and goodness and, and help us lord to to have that right spirit while not backing down on on the stand of things that are wicked or sinful we don't back down or tolerate as it were the you know things that you say not to tolerate lord but that we would be able to still try to live peaceably with all men and 
do the best that we can to um, preach the truth. And Lord, I pray that you please help our church to grow and to reach more people with that truth. It's in Jesus' name. We